So I just let me get myself set up here before we start. Okay, thanks, Jan. Uh, thanks for reading the Bible, and uh, please keep your Bible open uh, to that passage today, and you'll see your little outline with you as well. Uh, it's actually our second last sermon in the series, if you can believe it. Uh, we've gone through 12 talks in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Today's the second last one. Next week is the last one. And we're done. Uh, done with Thessalonians. We'll move on to the next part of, of our preaching series. But for today, I want to pray for us before we start. Uh, always good to ask God for his help before we get into his words. How about I pray and uh, we get into God's word together. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, it's a bit chilly, it's a bit cold. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that we can spend time indoors together. Uh, Father, we pray that your word would uh, warm our hearts, uh, Lord, towards uh, faithfulness and obedience. Uh, Lord, we pray that we'd be changed by your word as well. Uh, God, help us to become more and more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, as we start, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that maybe look very familiar to you. Uh, these pictures made the rounds last year. If you have any kind of social media or watch the news, you would have seen these and you would know the story behind these pictures. You see those ones? Right, you guys saw that a lot last year, maybe even this year as well. Uh, as you guys know, with COVID coming up or coming out last year, uh, people went a bit crazy. Uh, people felt a lot of panic and a lot of fear because of COVID. Uh, many people thought that they might lose their job and be stuck at home for weeks, maybe even months. And so in a lot of people's fear and panic, you know what they did? They all went to shopping centers and they bought a stack of toilet paper. So many people felt so uncertain, so afraid about the future, they didn't know what was gonna happen. And the way they prepared themselves, they went and bought toilet paper. Now, it got so crazy, you might have heard in the news that people even fought in the supermarkets, they were fighting each other over toilet paper. I even heard one report where a bunch of guys broke into a warehouse that stocked toilet paper and they only stole the toilet paper. They left everything else there, they just stole that. And so it was really crazy what was happening, isn't it? Because of COVID, people felt so insecure, so uncertain about their future, that the way they wanted to feel secure about the future, they bought toilet paper. That was their way to feel prepared. That was their way to feel safe and secure about an uncertain future. Now, when I saw that last year, I thought to myself, I would never do anything like that. I would never be that crazy and react that way and steal toilet paper. Who would do that? But when I really thought about it, I know that for me, whenever I feel uncertain about my future, I also feel fear and panic. And if there's one thing that makes me feel fear and panic about my future, it's when I look at my bank balance and it's low. I don't want to admit this to you, but every now and then I go on my phone, I open up my ComBank app, and I check my savings just to see how much money I have. Just to make sure that nothing's happened to it, no one stole my money, there's nothing been taken away from it, I just need to know my money is there. Can I just tell you, when I look at the number in my savings, when I see that it's all there, you know how I feel? I feel secure. I feel happy. I feel confident because my money is there. And if my money is there, I feel joyful in the present and secure in the future. I never realized this at the time, but money has a huge impact on me. If I have enough money, for me, in my mind and heart, I feel secure about my uncertain future. And if I'm really honest with myself, I don't think I'm any different to the people that you see in this picture. You see, when they face an uncertain future, they want to be secure in toilet paper. But when I feel uncertain, we're no different. We're exactly the same. So can I ask you this morning, what is it about you? When you feel uncertain about your future, where do you find your safety and your security? Is it toilet paper? Is it getting the, the COVID jab? Is having a good job or good grades, good family? What is it that you place your security and safety in? Now, if you remember from two weeks ago, we looked at uh, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. And we saw there that the Thessalonian Christians, they also felt um, fearful and panicked about an uncertain future. Right? They heard the lie 
that Jesus had already come back and they missed out. And so because they heard that lie, they felt fear, they felt panic. They didn't react very well to the news. Verse 2 tells us that they were shaken in their mind and they were alarmed in their heart. They didn't take it very well. Their faith in Jesus became unstable and their joy in Jesus was tarnished. But in that passage, Paul reminds them that their future security is based in God. He doesn't tell them to um, save up money. He doesn't tell them to collect toilet paper. He goes, no. He tells them that their future is secure because of who God is and what God has done. Their future is secure because of who God is and what God has done. And he looked at that last week. If you remember in the passage that we looked at two weeks ago, Paul says it's about who God is. And who is he? Well, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over the man of lawlessness, over what happens to him and what happens to people who follow him. Everything that leads up to the event of Jesus' return, God is sovereign over everything. And what has God done? He has finished the work of salvation in Jesus. His life, death, and resurrection is finished, complete, can't be added onto it. And so any time you and I talk about Christian security or Christian hope or Christian confidence, remember, it's always based on two things. Who God is and what God has done. Who God is and what God has done. In other words, our future security is based on God's character and God's work. Uh, let me give you a very quick visual demonstration. Um, if you want to look at the table here in front of me, or maybe even the table where Ben is, is uh, sitting at, if you look at all the things on the table, the, the laptops, the drink bottle, now I know that those things will not fall off. I know those things are secure on the table because the table is being held up by two legs. I know those two legs will support the table and will hold up anything on the table. It's secure it won't fall off because it's got two strong pillars. And friends, can I tell you, if you're a Christian today, the same is true for you and me. If you are uncertain about your future, can I tell you that you can be absolutely certain about your future because it's standing on two solid legs, two solid pillars. Who God is and what God has done in Jesus. And so Paul, in the passage that we're going to look at, he actually expands on this idea. If you have a look at chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, in this little section here, Paul breaks out in prayer. He, he bursts out in prayer. And he praises God that the Thessalonian Christians and their future is secure. And he tells them that their future is secure because it's built on two things. Who God is and what God has done. That's where their future is. So how about we have a look at the prayer together and see how it applies to your lead today. If you have your Bible, have a look at chapter 2, verse 13 and 15. We'll look at the first part of Paul's prayer here. And Paul begins his prayer by thanking God that the Thessalonian Christians and their future is secure. He says that in verse 14, they will obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus on the day he returns. When Jesus comes back, every Christian will share in the glory of Jesus. This is the future. This is the certain, final, eternal hope that awaits every Christian. See, in the past, we have been justified and sanctified by the blood of Jesus. But in the future, when he comes back, we're going to be glorified justified, sanctified, glorified. What a magnificent future for Christians. And that's what we have. And this future glory is secure because God chose them as the first fruits to be saved. Our future is secure, our glory is secure because God chose us as the first fruits to be saved. God choosing us for salvation is one of the pillars that our security is built on. And this is something that Paul's actually talked about before. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul said, 
For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You see, friends, we believe the truth of the gospel. We believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We believe that good news and we are saved because God chose us. We don't believe because we choose. We believe because God chooses. The point of this is to show us just how secure our salvation is. If you want to know how safe your salvation is, it doesn't, it's not dependent on your choice. It's actually dependent on God's choice. That's what makes it secure. But I know that for some Christians, and maybe for some of you here today, the whole idea that God chooses us makes us feel a little bit uneasy, a little bit unsettled. The thinking goes like this. If God chooses me, that means I don't get to choose. And if I don't get to choose, I have no freedom. And you see, we live in a culture today that loves freedom, freedom of choice. I want to choose where I live, what car I drive, who I date, where, what I do with my life. I want to choose. Anytime I don't get to choose, someone is robbing me of my freedom to choose. And I think for a lot of the Christians, when it comes to this idea that God chooses us, we don't like it. Because it means that we are robbed of our choice, robbed of our freedom, robbed of our autonomy to choose for ourselves. But in fact, if we think that way, we're actually missing the importance of why the Bible emphasizes God's choosing. All right, think of it like this. Imagine for a moment if the security of your salvation in Jesus were dependent on you. Imagine if your future security depended on, depended on who you are and what you have done. If it were based, for example, on your feelings, well, then your security will always change because your feelings always change day to day. Imagine if it were based on your choice. Well, your security will also change because you choose different things all the time. Imagine if it were based on your good works. Well, your good works would never be good enough, not to God. You see, if the security of our salvation were based on us, it would be unstable, unpredictable, incomplete. You can't stand on that. There's no security in that. But the Bible says that since our salvation is based on God, then our salvation is secure. Because God's choice doesn't change, just like his character doesn't change. And God's work of salvation is complete. It has been finished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You can't take it away, and you can't add anything to it. It's done. And so our salvation security is built on who God is and what God has done. And friends, can I just tell you, there is no more safer and more secure ground for you and I to stand on than who God is and what he has done in Jesus because he chose us. And so the first thing we saw is that their future is secure because God chose them for salvation in Christ Jesus. But in the second half of the prayer, in verse 16 to 17, Paul says that their future is also secure because God has done something in the past, in the present, and in the future. If you're a Christian here today, then you've received the grace of God. And in the grace of God, he has done something for you in the past, in the present, and in the future that makes you absolutely certain and secure of where you stand. Three things, past, present, future future. Let me quickly look at each one that Paul says to us. First one, he says their future is secure because in the past, God the Father and Jesus Christ himself loved them. God the Father, Jesus the Son, loved them. The Bible tells us in love, God predestined us. The Bible tells us that God loved us before the world began. God set his affection of us on us even before we were created. Even before you and I existed, God already loved us long before in the past. And how did God show us his love? He showed us his love by sending to us his one and only son, Jesus, to live, die, 
and rise again. God not only loved us before the world began, he showed that love through Jesus. His love is made manifest, the Bible says. His love is revealed to us in Christ. And that love existed way before the world began, way in the past. And so Paul says their future is secure because God loved them before the past. And he showed that love in Jesus. Second, Paul says, their future is also secure because in the present, right now, God the Father and Jesus Christ himself gives them eternal comfort. God the Father, Jesus the Son, gives us eternal comfort. If you can remember, uh, back in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, after Jesus commissions his disciples, he gives them a promise. He says he promises that he'll be present with us until the very end of the age. you remember that? That's his promise. And Jesus kept that promise by giving us his Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present with us in our pain and in our trouble. Jesus is present with us in all our weaknesses. And this comfort, this presence, is happening right now through the Holy Spirit. You know why this is good news? It's good news because right now, friends, you may be going through pain and discomfort and trouble in your life, but can I just say that pain, that trouble you're going through, it's temporary. But the comfort you have in Jesus is eternal. The comfort you have in Jesus will outlast any suffering and pain or confusion you might be going through. The comfort he gives is not only comforting now, it's eternal. It will outlast anything we go through. Finally, friends, the third thing, Paul says that their future is secure because God the Father and Jesus Christ himself gives them good hope. God the Father and Jesus the Son gives us good hope. So hopefully you've seen as we've gone through 1 and 2 Thessalonians, one of the main things that Paul has preached about over and over and over again is this topic of hope. And this hope is tied up to the day when Jesus returns. He keeps pointing them to the day that Christ returns. He says, hope for that day. Wait for that day. In hope, he says, we wait for the day when Jesus returns. On that day, God's enemies will be judged and condemned. On that day, believers will obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus. And they'll become like Jesus in righteousness and holiness. And on that day, Jesus will fully establish his kingdom on earth where there'll be no more sin, suffering, pain, or tears. If you're a Christian today, there is great hope for you on the day when Jesus Christ returns. He loved us, he gives us comfort, and he gives us good hope. I mean, when you look at that, what an amazing prayer that Paul prays, isn't it? In verses 13 and 17. What an amazing prayer that Paul prays. These are Thessalonians who are fearful and panicked. They are worried about their life. They're worried about their future. They're facing so much suffering. They've heard all these lies about the return of Jesus. But Paul says that their security is secure, their future is secure based on the God who loves them, who chose them, who gives them comfort and hope. Who God is and what God has done is where their future is secure. It has nothing to do with toilet paper or money or anything else. If you're a Christian today, friends, your future is locked up. It is secure because it is built on God and God alone. Well, finally, as we come to the end, uh, Paul wraps this whole thing up in chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. He actually turns the tables. He says to the Thessalonians, I prayed for you. Now I want to ask that you pray for me. I mean, that's Christian fellowship, isn't it? Not that we just pray for each other, but we also pray for ourselves as well. We pray for other people. In chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, Paul asked them to pray for him. And he asked the church to pray that the gospel would speed ahead and be honored. Pray that the gospel would speed ahead and be honored. It's a weird way to phrase it. If you don't know what he means, I'm going to put it in a simple way. I'm going to make it rhyme for us. Rhyming is always fun. It's always easy to remember. 
Uh, essentially, what Paul asked the church to pray for, he's praying that the gospel would reach and teach. If you want to put speed ahead in, on it another way, he prays that the gospel would reach and teach. He says, pray that the gospel would reach the ends of the earth. Pray that the gospel would reach every hidden and unknown part of the world. Pray that the gospel would reach all people from every tribe and nation and language and ethnicity. And then pray that the gospel would teach, teach people about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Pray that the gospel would teach people what it means to believe in Christ. Pray that the gospel would teach people how they ought to live in trust and obedience to God. Pray that the gospel would reach and teach. Uh, Paul follows that up by also asking them to pray that he may be delivered from wicked and evil men. You see, Paul knows that a lot of people who hate him and a lot of people who hate the gospel, he remembers being threatened and kicked out of the city of Thessalonica. He remembers being treated very, very badly. And so Paul knows that the mission ahead of him is difficult. It is hard. And so he asked the church to Pray for him, and rightfully so. Reaching and teaching people with the gospel is very, very challenging because not every person he comes across will have faith. Many people will oppose Paul. They will oppose the gospel because not everyone that he talks to will have faith. Paul knows he's going to face a lot of obstacles along the way because not everyone has faith. It can sound very discouraging, can't it? It can shake any Christian's confidence to know that every people, that people that we come across will not have faith. We might be thinking, well, what's the point? If not all people have faith, why reach and teach the gospel? Why do it? It seems pointless. My confidence would be shaken at this point. You know what's amazing about this? Paul is also secure. The Thessalonians are secure. But Paul is also secure. How so? He knows that people may not have faith, but the Lord is faithful. The people that I talk to, the people who I work with may not have faith, but the God I work for, he is faithful. You see, Paul doesn't trust in the people that he meets. He doesn't trust in his own eloquence or his own ability or his own power to get things done. No, he trusts in the faithfulness of God. That's where his security is. It's in who God is and what God has done. He's applying the same thing that he told the church to himself. Paul knows that this is God's gospel, God's mission, God's world. No one cares more about the salvation of the lost than God does. And so for this reason, Paul is secure in the mission ahead because God is faithful to his people and he's faithful to his work of the gospel. What an amazing prayer. What an amazing passage. As we come to the, to the end of all this, we see that these prayers, hopefully you can see, that these prayers remind you and I that we either place our future security in who God is and what he has done, or we place our future security in toilet paper, money, or something else. There's only two choices that we have. You may remember the story of the rich young man in Matthew 19. Does that ring a bell? The rich young man or the rich young ruler, as our mother, our pastor Bible call it. If you've never heard this story, there's a story of a man who comes to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions, give all that money to the poor, and then come and follow Jesus. Now, for all his life, this rich young man had placed all his identity, all his security in his money. But at that very moment, Jesus challenged him to place his security, not in his riches, but to place it in Jesus. And you know what happens at the end of the story? Sadly, the man walks away from Jesus sad and sorrowful because he had great possessions. He walked away from Jesus because he was so rich, he didn't want to give that up. 
essentially friends, he chose to build his future security on his money rather than building his future security on the solid rock of Jesus. And he walked away. Friends, the choice is still presented to you and me today. Either we build our future security on things like toilet paper or money or work or friends or a job, or we build our future security on who God is and what he has done. We build it on the God who chose us, loved us, gave us comfort and hope and is faithful. So friends, can I just tell you now, toilet paper, money, work, friends, family, you know what they all have in common? They will all one day run out. They don't last forever. But you know what does? Who God is and what he has done. Place your security on what lasts, on what is solid as a rock. Who God is and what he has done in Jesus. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we know that anytime we try to set and secure our future on the things of this world, it's like sinking sand. It will just disappear right underneath our feet. And God, for all of us, we've tried to place our security in something other than you. But God, we thank you for the prayer that Paul prayed today. Reminding the Thessalonians and reminding us today that the only safe ground we stand on in, is in who you are and what you have done in Jesus. Father, we thank you that you have chosen us, you've chosen us, you've loved us, you gave us comfort and hope, and you are faithful. Thank you that we stand on the solid rock of what you have done in Jesus. Help us to stay firm and remain here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And just before I go, you might have noticed that um, during our, our service day, we haven't done prayer for the nation. You might have noticed that. Uh, that's because we're going to do prayer for nations right here, right now, after we've just looked at a good passage in the Bible talking about prayer. I think it'd be a bit of a shame that we kind of studied Paul's prayer, but then we didn't pray ourselves. Like, what a shame that would be. So that should be a good opportunity for us to actually see how this prayer in today's passage applies to you and me today. So we're going to do a bit of prayer for the nations based upon the passage today. Now, as you know, uh, Paul in the passage prayed for the Thessalonian Christians because he knew that they were fearful and panicked about their future. They felt insecure about their future. And so Paul prayed for them to remind them that their future is secure because of who God is and what he has done. Where do we apply that today? Now, I want you guys to have a think about your own life at the moment. In particular, I want you to have a think about some of the people in your life, friends, colleagues at work, students that you go to school with, uh, family members, whatever it might be. Now, maybe in your life, you know someone who is struggling to feel secure about their future. Maybe you know someone who feels insecure about their work or their finances. Maybe you know someone who feels insecure about their family or their home life. Maybe you know someone who feels insecure about their health and their well-being. Maybe you know someone who feels insecure about their relationship with Jesus and they don't, they're not sure where they stand. Maybe you know someone who's having a really hard time in life and the last thing they feel is secure. If you know such a person, I want to encourage you to pray for them today and pray these words from the prayer that we looked at today. Here's a couple of prayer points. I want to encourage you to pray for that person and pray that they would find Find their ultimate security in who God is and what God has done. Ask God to give them security in the truth that he chose them, loves them, and gives them comfort and hope. Ask God to make them secure in the finished work of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming. Ask God to help them build their hope and trust in Jesus. And lastly, friends, because it's prayer for the nations, let's pray for the nations. And pray the way that Paul prayed. Pray that the gospel would reach and teach. Every single week, we pray for different nations 
Can we keep praying that every nation on earth will be reached with the gospel? And as the gospel goes to them, pray that the, the workers there would teach people faithfully the gospel. And please pray that all the people who do that, that they would trust not in themselves or in their work, but they'll trust in the God who is faithful. He's the one who will get the work done. So those are the, the four prayer points there. And just like we normally do, I'm going to give you, I'll give you all a couple of moments to pray for that. Um, I'm going to pray along with you as well. And after a while, I'll come back and I'll close up for us in prayer. So how about we pray for these things today? Let's do it. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you again for, Lord, this great prayer that Paul prayed in 2 Thessalonians. Father, Lord, that this is, we thank you that this is a prayer of security, that we find our ultimate security in who you are and what you have done in Jesus. And Father, at this moment, we probably have our friends and family or people that we know who are feeling are quite uncertain, a bit shaky about their future. Uh, either when it comes to our family life or work life, their health or their finances, or even their own faith. But Father, we ask and pray, God, that you would help them to have ultimate security on the rock that is Jesus Christ, our refuge, our hiding place. We pray, Father God, you would help us to be people of prayer, that we would pray for those people who are struggling. And finally, God, we also want to pray for those who are bringing the gospel, God, out to all the world. 
We ask God that your gospel would reach all people, all the corners of the earth, and that all people will be taught the gospel and will receive the gospel. Wherever that may be, God, right here in Kingsgrove or somewhere in Sydney or Australia, right across the world, will your gospel be honored? Will it cover all the parts of this world? so that you might be glorified and that people will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We ask and pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to say when the stands and we're going to sing our last song.